Is it hard to come up with ideas? Uh, I don't know. I just I've just noticed that people expect expect more of a thematic angle with the, with our music. You know, they always want to read into it. And before, I was just using pieces of poetry and just just garble, just garbage. You know, just stuff that just would spew out of me at the time. And a lot of times, when I write lyrics, it's just at the last second because I'm really lazy. So, and then I'm I find myself having to come up with explanations for it. You know, so I thought I'd you know prevent that this time and, and actually have an explanation for some of the songs at least. Hi everyone, Blind Dweller here. Today I decided to slowly edge myself closer towards another art form that has been a huge part of my life for as long as I can remember, which is music. A topic that I've not really touched upon that much yet on this channel, at least ever since I first started this channel as being a hub for my drum and bass mixes way back in the day before I rebranded myself. I know, who would afford it, right? But music very much is still important to me. For example, at the very beginning, I've made my own soundtracks for my videos, whether that be manipulating samples to make the music, or playing something on my trusty tiny MIDI keyboard myself. And specifically for today, I wanted to explore some weird and wonderful creative works made by one of my all-time heroes in music, Kurt Cobain, the iconic frontman of a famous American rock band, Nirvana, and practically the face of a rock music genre known as grunge even though he may have not cared so much for that, but we'll get into that later. Apart from being an incredibly talented and unique songwriter who redefined possibilities in rock music, Kurt would also explore his creative side in many other aspects outside of his music career, such as sketches, paintings and sculptures, some of which would make it onto Nirvana albums right up until he tragically took his own life, aged just 27, in 1994. The vast array of surreal imagery that Kurt would create is surprising and absolutely fascinating, with so many thought-provoking elements that link to his music, or even the darkest side of his mind and past. There have been numerous, well-produced and informative documentaries released on Kurt and Nirvana over the years, but only a select few on many of his other creative talents, which are arguably equally as intriguing as his music. And so today, we'll be exploring not only how Kurt learned and improved in music, but also how he excelled as an artist as a whole, whether he knew it or not, by also looking at how he experimented in his painting, photography, and many other forms of media, and mediums. My old man actually suggested this idea to me. He's the one who got me into Nirvana when I was a kid, so I want to personally thank him for today's video topic. And of course, thank you guys so much for tuning in, and welcome to another video. Today we explore what I guess we could call the multi-art of Kurt Cobain. Kurt Donald Cobain was born in Aberdeen, a logging town in Washington State, USA, on the 20th of February, 1967. He was born in the local Gray's Hospital to fairly modest parents, Donald Leland Cobain, who then worked at a gas station, and Wendy Elizabeth Freidenberg, who worked as a waitress. The new parents met each other in high school and shortly married after graduating, despite their young age at the time. Wendy, for one, only being 18 years old when they managed to legally marry in Idaho. This interesting 60s period in America consisted of capitalism basically reaching the peak of its ideology. Affordable housing, well-paying jobs in almost any industry, free enterprise and plenty of safe neighborhoods to raise big families. 
This was the ideal picture, but of course, wasn't exactly reality in most working class communities of America, save for the booming logging industry at the time in Aberdeen, according to Donald Cobain, where people expected young adults to begin their family life as soon as possible, and as perfectly as possible. This was no exception for Donald and Wendy Cobain. Whilst most young newlyweds and soon-to-be parents during this time would be expected to be a perfect fit for each other and their respective families, this unfortunately would not be the case in Kurt's family as he grew older. Being a free-spirited, socially active and extroverted young lady when she gave birth to Kurt, Wendy would often feel existential thoughts about her marriage to Don, but would continue to stay to ensure she could raise Kurt, who she believes, quote, had to be born. Kurt's younger sister, Kimberly, would also be born three years later. As a toddler, Kurt was energetic, curious, and very sweet-natured towards his family members and the world around him. He would constantly feel the need to sing, dance, dress up, and reenact his favorite movie and TV show characters. His love for music and art would also start at a very young age. After buying Kurt a little drum kit when he was as young as 10 months old, his fascination in musical instruments and frequent habit of being a little performer to his family and friends would begin to flourish. This would mostly be encouraged by Wendy's side of the family, however. Donald Cobain, on the other hand, had a slightly different perspective, regarded by Wendy many years later after their eventual divorce as a sort of father who believed children should be seen and not heard, and not a particular advocate for music or the arts. Wendy, however, and indeed most of her side of the family, had very creative personalities. Wendy would recount a time when she was painting, and Kurt, being seven or eight months old at the time, wanted to sit on her lap and draw with her. To her amazement, after Kurt spent some time mimicking her hand movements, he would begin to draw perfect circles on his piece of paper, leading Wendy to teach him how to draw eyes for a face. And this, according to her, would mark the beginning of a very artistic side to Kurt that would develop and improve as he grew older, eventually leading Wendy's brother and Kurt's uncle Chuck to request Kurt to draw him as Mickey Mouse after noticing an impressive drawing of Pluto he made. Once Kurt drew the picture, a shocked Uncle Chuck would approach Wendy saying, quote, Wendy, look at this. He's not drawing like most people do, and would describe how Kurt would meticulously draw his nose and ears first, as opposed to how most kids would draw a head first and add facial features afterwards. Kurt instead would draw very specific sections of a face first, then fill out the rest later, almost like how a formerly trained artist would draw, which according to Chuck, was fascinating to watch. Now, I'm obviously not going to sit here and say Kurt's childhood drawings are masterful works of art or anything, that would be really pretentious, but it's still worth considering them briefly, as it shows an interesting eye for detail even at Kurt's very young age, as well as a mind that seemed to soak up everything around him, to inspire him to create his own worlds, which would significantly begin to evolve as he grew older. There is also just one particular element I couldn't help but notice in his childhood drawing of the Disney character Goofy, which is what appears to be marionette strings attached to his wrists. The reason why this stood out to me is that the art Kurt would produce later in life would also display this kind of imagery. I just find it quite interesting how such a concept fascinated Kurt in one way or another from as early as his childhood right up until he was a famous musician. By 1976, Kurt, now nine years old, would eventually discover that his parents, now reaching the peak of the strain of their relationship, were arranging for a divorce. By this age, Kurt was already a child struggling to express his thoughts and tame his emotions. Although both his parents seemingly were at a loss at how to handle their son, the relationship between Kurt and his father Don was recounted by relatives as particularly traumatic. Kurt would develop an absolute resentment towards feelings of ridicule or embarrassment, to the point where it would spiral into fits of rage, an inner turmoil that would sadly continue towards the end of his life, which many believe was stemmed from Don's public taunts, bullying and degrading comments that began in Kurt's early childhood. Kurt's younger sister Kim would even recount times that Don would thump Kurt in order to reprimand him for fairly minor mistakes, such as forgetting to do the dishes or taking out the garbage. 
In spite of his traumatic relationship with his father, however, it would still prove to be heartbreaking for Kurt to learn of his parents' separation and having to see his father leave the household. He would become less social and more withdrawn, which would later fester into Kurt being defiant towards his mother Wendy when he would remain with her and his younger sister Kim. This behaviour would only increase as he approached adolescence, with Wendy eventually handing Kurt over to his father Don Cobain, now no longer able to handle him. It would be sometime during this period that Don would later reveal to Kurt that he would marry once again to a woman named Jenny, who also had children of her own. The news would devastate Kurt, not just due to the fact that Don had apparently promised to his son that he would never remarry, a promise that young Kurt took very close to heart, but also because of Jenny's two children, Mindy and James, whom Kurt regarded as competition for his father's time and affection. Jenny would eventually have a child of her own with Don, giving birth to a baby boy of the name Chad. By the time Kurt was a teenager, he would spend most of his time going to and from different family members' houses, never truly feeling at home anywhere. Although seemingly Kurt got on well with his new stepmother at first, and even reportedly adored his young half-brother Chad, Kurt in the end still struggled to adjust from the life he once had as an only boy to one of four children in a single household, often bullying and teasing the stepchildren, according to their mother Jenny. The taunts and bullying would still continue from Don as well. Eventually, he too could not handle the teenager, but Kurt could not move back with his mother Wendy due to her being in an ongoing abusive relationship with a new man. Already a witness to some of his domestic abuse, Kurt at first would be forced away from Wendy, who chose instead to commit herself to her abusive partner. So Kurt would live for a short time with his uncles, Don Cobain's brother Jim, and of course Wendy's brother Chuck, who was a family member in a band and who had all the music equipment that Kurt adored. And at some time during this stay, with the encouraging music-minded uncle, Kurt would receive from his uncle his very first electric guitar for his 14th birthday in 1981. Kurt was naturally left-handed, and so the guitar would be restrung upside down in order for Kurt to play, which would kickstart a soon-to-be-discovered world of possibilities for the teenager, already desperate for a way to escape his broken life. Kim would recount days during when he would eventually move back in with her, and their mother Wendy, of Kurt playing the same loud guitar chords over and over again and singing badly, or perhaps trying to find his voice as he began to write his own songs. Wendy would even recount times when Kurt would be considered a default person in the neighbourhood to hand over unused musical instruments to, as he would simply find a way to play everything he can get his hands on. And of course, his passion in painting and artwork would continue to expand. By the time he reached high school, he would become excitedly drawn to working with new different mediums such as clay work, oil painting and acrylics. You can really see the attention to detail, and the expressive elements increase with each painting and sketch that he produces as he ages. I actually find myself particularly drawn to the paintings and sketches he made during his teen years. Not only do they become increasingly sophisticated in technique, but they also provide a very clear view into the state of mind of a young, soon-to-be rock star. A lot of Kurt's imagery from his teenage paintings in the early 80s are particularly telling, showing Kurt's awareness and eye for his surroundings brought to life from paintings of local Aberdeen fishing docks and lighthouses, and all of a sudden, to break this collection of harmonious scenes is a painting by Kurt of a burning house, whether this was a representation of a real incident of a house fire Kurt witnessed, or an early example of Kurt trying to convey his anger and heartbreak over the loss of his former family life, portraying it as a family house burning to the ground, is obviously uncertain. But given his personality and state of mind during these years of his youth, it is extremely telling and powerful imagery to digest, especially from someone so young. In order to eventually become the renowned songwriter he was destined to be, however, Kurt could not learn how to play instruments alone, and simply pluck inspiration out of thin air to begin writing songs of his own. Kurt would need like-minded musicians to meet, and music to relate to. Music could in some way provide a place where he could unload his frustration and depression by musicians that came from the very same place, 
Kurt would still remain a fan of his childhood favourites, such as the Beatles, but perhaps his other childhood favourite of the Ramones may have in the end led Kurt to the raw, loud and deliberately obnoxious sound of punk rock that he would find irresistible. But most likely, his deeper adventure into the genre that led him to harder and more relatable types of punk such as hardcore would be set by his eventual close friend that he would meet during his teen years who also happened to be a like-minded guitarist named Roger Buzz Osborne. He was, and still is, the guitarist and frontman of a heavy sludgy rock band called The Melvins, who since the beginning have experimented with low tuning, heavy feedback, deep thunderous drums and distorted bass guitar, accompanied by howling vocals with ambiguous, emotionally driven lyrics, a sound that Kurt would devour with excitement when he first saw them perform, and an experience he would write about in his journals as having a huge impact on him. Although by now his talents in music were improving by the time Kurt was in Aberdeen High School, he was still not in a band of his own, and although talented in music and proficient in art, he unfortunately, or fortunately depending on how you look at it, did not pursue these skills in further education. In fact, if his social difficulties with many fellow classmates weren't hard enough, by now Kurt's rebellious attitude was preventing him from having sufficient attendance records or consistency with his grades. Kurt instead would choose his time to partake in petty crime, such as vandalism and smoking weed. But in the end, only two weeks prior to his graduation, Kurt realised he had not enough credits to graduate, and subsequently dropped out of high school. Now back living with Wendy at this stage, the message from her to her son was brutally clear at that moment. He had to get a job, or move out. But after just a week, Kurt would come home to find his belongings outside the front door of his house. Whether he was ready or not, the latter choice was now the reality. And for a good while between 1984 and 85, Kurt would be basically homeless, drifting between the houses of friends and family whilst looking for work. Although this would seem to be a bitter, literal shove out of the door from Wendy, she did nonetheless help him gather what qualifications he had for his resume, and would spend the next period working odd jobs, including as a janitor at his previous high school. His sister Kim would later go on to say how he got in trouble for throwing a computer out of the window whilst working there, though she also admitted that this could have been a rumour. Regardless, such a future would not be enough to motivate Kurt for long. His creative side was still yearning. Even when he was living in a run-down slum with barely any money to get by, he would continue to fall deeper in love with art and music. And so it would be roughly around this time that he would meet another young punk rock fan and bass player at a Melvin's rehearsal named Chris Novoselic. After becoming close friends, Kurt would one day be invited along by Chris to visit their mother's hair salon in a spare room that was available upstairs, to which the newfound partners in hard rock saw a potential rehearsal space to jam together. Kurt had recently experienced playing in a band for the first time with his friend Buzz Osborne, in a quote, joke band called Fecal Matter. But now that Kurt had put his difficult school life behind him, now that he was improving in his creative abilities and of course, growing up, his view on music was beginning to change, and a more sincere and profound songwriter was beginning to emerge, so a new band with a new image needed to match. And the conception of this band, later to become Nirvana, in itself came from a very interesting side of Kurt's youth and outlook on the world. According to the biography written by Charles R. Cross called Heavier Than Heaven, a biography of Kurt Cobain. It details during Kurt's teen years, he would experience rediscovering his faith in God when he would stay with a heavily Christian family of his friend Jesse Reed, and would eventually regularly start attending church and become inspired by Christian imagery. However, and this is a big however, it is still very debatable on whether or not Kurt was attracted to religion in the literal spiritual sense or simply from an artistic perspective. There is still a clear fascination in such concepts, which can be seen as early as the 80s in not just his music, but many of his illustrations and 3D models. And it would not be Christianity alone that would inspire Kurt and his art. In fact, both Kurt and Chris Novoselic would share an interest in Jainism and Buddhist philosophy, which may indeed explain how they eventually chose the name Nirvana, which, when you think about it, is probably one of the most appropriate band names ever conceived in terms of where Kurt and Chris came from. Nirvana, in Buddhist terms, basically means freedom from pain, suffering, and the external world, 
that not only reflected what Kurt saw endlessly from life, but it also went hand in hand with the mantra of the music Kurt and Chris both adored, with bands like The Melvins, Black Flag, Sonic Youth, and Bad Brains performing music that was essentially saying f you to traditionalism, conformity, and the mainstream influence. It was a name that was not only unique at the time, but it made perfect sense and defined the band as people. After finally meeting a potential drummer for this new band in the making, named Aaron Burkhardt, Kurt would finally begin to untangle his complicated mind, revealing the first seeds of what would later blossom into one of the most important bands in rock history. One thing that I always find interesting about Chris Novoselic is that in a great deal of his interviews, he expresses a lot how artistic Kurt Cobain truly was. Even during the days when he first met Kurt, Chris recounts many times of how he would constantly see Kurt defacing flyers or collecting bizarre objects to change into something of Kurt's imagination. Even for his janitorial job, Kurt would envision and design logos and an entire image for his trade. His longing to express his own creativity seemed to follow everywhere he went. When Kurt would eventually meet, fall in love, and move in with his first serious girlfriend, Tracy Miranda, she too would recount in great detail how even on days when Kurt wouldn't be working, he was constantly distracting his busy mind with painting, writing music, or simply writing whatever and whenever he could in his now famous journals. It would also be during this relationship, he would acquire a 4-track cassette recorder in which he would start experimenting with audio recordings and sampling, which would kickstart a vast collection of bizarre tapes with song demos, spoken words, and basically whatever Kurt felt like at the time. One example for you, listen to the song Beans by Kurt Cobain. I'll say no more, just listen to it, it's bloody amazing. And of course, this would eventually see the creation of a famous montage of Heck tape. In addition to this, as well as a collection of vintage toys or any strange paraphernalia he could get his hands on, close friends would also detail another newfound inspiration for Kurt that was beginning to develop during this time, which was his fascination in human anatomy. This kind of imagery would later become iconic to Nirvana, but even during the earliest days of a band, you can see glimpses of famous Nirvana-themed paintings, future album art ideas, and basically almost an entire world that seems to pour out of him. Kurt longed for a dark outlet in his creativity, and normally revolved around horrific, gory dismemberment or gruesome deaths. But as Chris Novoselic quite rightly describes, it is done with skill and care. It goes to little surprise how many close to Kurt would agree that he saw beauty in such concepts and imagery. It would even make its way onto his music later on, but we'll get more into that in a little bit. Tracy would begin to see the strangest collections of anatomy-themed objects scattered around their home, models of organs or clay figures and body parts, and she even remembered apparently seeing a big collage of photos of, well, let's just call them diseased lady parts. Although those who knew Kurt best knew that this was just what to expect from him, even his girlfriend would occasionally be caught off guard it would seem. In terms of the band side of things, it would be a disappointing slow start as far as Kurt Cobain and Chris Novoselic were concerned. Although Kurt had finally found a long-term musical ally in Chris, they appeared to struggle to find a suitable drummer during the start. Although they decided to invite Aaron in as their drummer, he unfortunately turned out to be quote, culturally different, as Chris put it. Aaron made a racial slur in front of a black cop, he would continue. And that was a deal killer right there. This would begin a trend of trialling a series of drummers until finally meeting Chad Changing, who would feature on their soon-to-be debut studio album called Bleach. Released in 1989 and recorded the previous year, the opportunity to record with the grunge-defining Seattle label Sub Pop came from a recommendation from a music producer named Jack and Dino at Reciprocal Studios, who had previously worked with the band. The executive and co-founder of Sub Pop, Jonathan Poneman, was impressed with what he heard and offered to record a single, marking a start of things finally happening for the already touring and hard-working rock band. By this time, the sound of a band was deliberately untapped, deranged, and most importantly, it was emotive. The importance of the music being emotionally resonant was incredibly sacred to Kurt, and although he strived for success with Nirvana, he had a very specific vision in mind. He did not care for trends, nor discriminating genres of music for another. 
He adored anger-fueled music, but he equally adored softer songs with insightful lyrics and acoustic guitar. In short, he adored music as a whole, so long as it was honest and emotive. This may explain a few of the complications Kurt would come to face when he would finally begin to set foot into the more serious music industry. Even during the recording of Bleach, he would reportedly feel pressured into dropping and replacing songs constantly, or even having to write new music altogether for the album in order for it to correlate nicely with the up-and-coming music scene in Seattle at the time, known as grunge. And although Kurt is widely considered to be the very epitome of grunge rock, like I said, he cared little for trends and certainly felt he had no responsibility for it. But the now popular genre was heavily favoured by Sub Pop. As a result, some songs contain lyrics that were apparently hastily written the night before, leaving the band to look back on their first album with bitter dissatisfaction. Regardless of this though, some of the songs produced on this album, whether rushed or not, capture some of the rawest and most intense vocal performances out of Kurt Cobain, to the point where he's almost acting out his inner turmoil in front of a microphone, accompanied by the huge drum sounds of Chad Channing, Chris's liquidy bass lines, and of course Kurt's guitar sound seems to scream and shout on this album. One of the strangest small details I fell in love with Kurt's playing style was how Kurt would tend to just let the guitar howl and feed back bending the squeals with his tremolo arm, making it sound as if the guitar is screaming alongside him. Almost like he gave his guitars a voice to replicate the noise that Kurt experienced in his head. Although many legendary guitarists have used guitar feedback in many creative ways, Kurt's guitar sound from this album onwards would become so heavily recognisable. What makes some of the songs on this first album truly unique compared to later releases though, is how some of them perfectly capture what life was like growing up in Aberdeen for Kurt. Being the main songwriter of the band, the lyrics of all Nirvana songs would be his own, therefore inspired by his real inner monologue and experiences in his hometown. Probably the hardest hitting song on the album, for me at least, is the slow, sludgy, deranged and haunting song called Paper Cuts which would later be revealed to be partly inspired from a real-life incident in Kurt's hometown of Aberdeen, when a family kept their two children locked up in the attic of their house. Kurt wrote the song after reading the story in the news. In a 1989 interview, he explained he actually knew one of the siblings, quote, His brother and sister were locked in the house and abused by their parents for years. They were treated as dogs for the first five or six years of their lives. It is also somewhat of an unknown easter egg type song if you like, within their discography, as it's the only known song of Nirvana's in which their band name is directly referenced in the lyrics. Following the experience with recording and releasing Bleach with Sub Pop Records, the general feeling of Kurt and the band was somewhat hollow and deflated not 100% satisfied with how they were puppeted by the label throughout the process, Kurt was keen to move swiftly on to the next step, to play bigger shows, upgrade to a major label deal if possible, and improve their sound in a way that would avoid any potential compromise. This unfortunately would also mean the end of the line for Chad Channing. Despite how big and thunderous the drums were on the album, something was not quite there for Kristen Kurt eventually replacing him with a young drummer named Dave Grohl, who had just recently left a hardcore punk band called Scream, who both Kurt and Chris would later discover was not only a ferocious drummer who hit the drums hard, but also a talented songwriter himself. Roughly during this time would also mark the end of a relationship between Kurt and Tracy, who by this time were beginning to distance from each other, as Nirvana's success steadily began to build momentum in the background. Nirvana were beginning to play more regularly on local and underground radio stations. More crowds began to turn up at their gigs, as well as higher demand for them to go on tour, and more sales of their debut album were beginning to pick up. Particularly in the UK music scene, who Dave Grohl would later admit would become a second home for the band during the early years. However, it would all seem minuscule compared to what impact their next project would ignite. Kurt's songwriting began to take on a more refined and almost experimental sound, where before it was rare for Kurt to be seen playing with little more than a heavily distorted guitar and amp. He was now experimenting with guitar pedals live to create more interesting dynamics in their songs. 
For example, now instead of relying solely on the guitar amp for distortion, he would start using an external distortion pedal, allowing Kurt to switch from loud overdriven guitar to softer clean guitar quickly with his feet while singing on stage. This would also be accompanied by what is known as a chorus pedal, which is how Kurt would get that deep, colourful and watery sound on his guitar. It was particularly popular with 80s bands at the time before the release of their next album. In many ways, an electric guitar with chorus effects is a very 80s defining sound. But when it was added to the gritty chords of Kurt's music, it became a far more aggressive and almost trippy sound if you can call it that. This new sound that Kurt had adopted and perfected would make its way from a rehearsal space to the stage and then finally onto their second studio album that would later be called Nevermind, released in 1991. With songs like Smells Like Teen Spirit, In Bloom, Come As You Are, Lithium and Territorial Pissings, which I've just realised is not a song name I've ever said out loud until now, would all share this later to be iconic sound of Nirvana. Smells Like Teen Spirit, for many clear reasons, has always been seen as the best example of the new quote, box of tricks, as Chris Novoselic put it, that Nirvana had adopted for themselves at this period for their songs. Quiet to loud and loud to quiet dynamics and pop music was rarely ever heard of, but from hearing such songs with a loud chorus and a soft verse, or vice versa, from bands such as the Pixies, another huge musical influence on Nirvana, Kurt would be keen to incorporate this into their song structures. The Pixies had released successful songs that followed this dynamic heavily, like Where Is My Mind and Gouge Away, which would alternate between quiet and loud song sections. In fact, when this was put into effect for their song Smells Like Teen Spirit, Dave Grohl, still relatively new to the band at this time, was concerned that it sounded like a blatant rip-off of the Pixies. But regardless, as the song came together, both as a band and later in the studio with producer Butch Vig from DGC Records, it would later unexpectedly become recognised as the band's defining single, and one of the biggest rock anthems in the history of the genre. Though it would simply be a crime to praise Nevermind for Smells Like Teen Spirit alone, as each song seems to have its own unique personality and attitude. And of course, the work that Dave and Chris brought to Kurt's songs arguably couldn't have been done by anyone else. There is a playful nature to Nova Selic's bass lines that seem to bend and bounce underneath Kurt's guitar chords. For a genre inspired by simple hardcore punk, it's fascinating to hear such intricate and instantly recognisable bass lines that could have easily sounded so much more simple and hidden behind the guitar. Which shows again the band's huge range of musical influences. In terms of Kurt's vocals, producer Butch Vig, knowing that Kurt was a huge Beatles fan, managed to convince him to do multiple takes of singing in order to layer up his vocals, a technique that John Lennon used frequently when recording his vocals for Beatles records. And as for Dave's drumming, I mean, what can you say? Dave taught himself how to play drums using pillows on his bed when he was young which is amazing in itself, but the way he hits the drums with such ferocity and perfect timing is something nearly akin to that of John Bonham from Led Zeppelin. It's because of drummers like these that I'm such a sucker for hard-hitting drums when I play in bands, because it completely adds so much more energy to the music, which just seems to blast through the speakers like bullets in every song. Of course, as previously done in Bleach, Nevermind would not just be a straight list of loud heavy rock music, but would also include softer songs, arguably more so than before, with the sound of an acoustic guitar being heard for the first time from the band, with songs like Polly, the sixth track on the album, and Something in the Way, which would be the last official track on the album, before the eventual hidden track on later releases, called Endless Nameless. Something in a way, contrary to popular belief, was not written about a real experience living under a bridge in his hometown of Aberdeen, as opposed to a bridge that Kurt would simply occasionally visit. 
Although this is common knowledge now, listening to the lyrics of his particularly haunting song still paints a particularly vivid picture that was nevertheless inspired from somewhere. Kurt was a man who did experience homelessness briefly, and who spent a great deal of his uncertain periods not knowing whether he would ever escape from it. Something so chilling and tragic comes out in that song that Kurt almost whispers when he sings, which can't help but make you picture wandering the streets on a grey, rainy day in Aberdeen, a town that Kurt truly felt shunned and rejected from, and probably more so during this particular period. It is honestly such a beautiful, melancholic song. As the band continued to tour, Kurt's creative side still wouldn't be concealed, it would appear. To name one example, there is a revealing interview that recounts the infamous event at the venue known as Trees in Dallas, where Kurt is caught on camera getting into an altercation with a bouncer during a crowd surf, resulting in Kurt knocking a bouncer in the face with his guitar and then getting punched by the bouncer in response. But it's what took place before this incident, which is highlighted in the interview by the concert promoter, Jeffrey Lills, that shows an even more curious behaviour of Kurt. The band had only recently released Nevermind, and were asked to sign a number of posters provided by the label to later go out to the people that the band had recently worked with for Nevermind. Dave and Chris would swiftly leave their signatures, but Kurt would spend as much as five minutes per poster, illustrating and drawing, rather than just signing his name. All these dudes are like standing around like, what is this dude's problem, man? Does he not know how to f sign an autograph? You know, is, 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 is he doing this to f with us? I mean, we need his name on these posters. We need to get this done. Just can you go tell him to do that? And I'm like, you want me to go over there and tell him just to hurry up and sign autographs? I'm like, I'm not going to do that. If you want him to do it, you go tell him. Weasley Geffen dude walked over and was like, dude, can you just please, you know, speed this up a little bit or whatever? So Kurt like looked at him and was like, oh, whatever, and then just started drawing on the next one, you know? And I was like, F man, this is going to be weird. I, I knew this was just going to be a f***ed up day, you know? I can't help but find this scenario really interesting. Not only is Kurt doing something creative in an almost inappropriate circumstance, but despite causing an awkward situation for the staff and the label representatives, I personally feel Kurt wanted to leave something more unique to people, rather than just his name. I don't know about the rest of you, but if that doesn't sum up an artist wanting to truly leave a personal interaction with the people he meets, I don't know what else does. By September 24th, 1991, 46,251 copies of Nevermind would be shipped to stores in the United States, whilst 35,000 copies would be released in the UK. However, over the next coming months, following further touring and further single releases such as Come As You Are and Smells Like Teen Spirit, the possibilities of what can successfully break into mainstream music would officially be changed forever. The cultural influence that Nirvana was beginning to have on the world would be described as nothing short of Beatlemania by many associates of a band following the release of Nevermind. DGC Records, the American label Nirvana had just recorded Nevermind under, was once a division of Interscope Geffen A&M Records, the parent company being none other than Universal Music Group. So in terms of reaching the objective of breaking through to the major music industry, Nirvana had pretty much completed their mission. But even so, the company predicted that no more than a quarter of a million copies would be sold. Still a successful album as far as Nirvana would be concerned. However, within barely three months of the release of the album and their single, Smells Like Teen Spirit, Nevermind was selling 400,000 copies a week in the US alone. Nirvana hadn't merely found success. At this stage, practically the entire world was watching them. In the UK, their second home seemingly had gotten no less hospitable, with likes of Top of the Pops, arguably one of the biggest shows on British television at the time, was inviting the outsider rock band to perform, leading to what I think one of the most legendary TV performances from the band that I've ever seen. Like, it still amazes me and makes me laugh to this day. This would just be one example of the amount of attention Nirvana was now having to get used to after so long playing to half-empty bars. It was interview after interview, show after show, talk show performance after talk show performance. If it wasn't Nirvana related, it simply wasn't cool. 
Magazines all of a sudden began to have Kurt's face on the front cover. Fans were beginning to follow the band to and from venues, and even beginning to dress like them. All within the space of barely a year. A dream come true for some aspiring musicians out there, but not so much it would seem for Kurt. I always find it interesting, even today, how there is still a slight debate over whether or not Kurt Cobain wanted to be famous. Some believe there was an awful tragedy that surrounded Kurt about him just falling into fame that he didn't want, whilst others contrary to this believe that he simply lied about not wanting to be famous. But personally, I believe it's a little bit more complicated than that. Kurt did want to be successful, but he had a specific future in mind. Kurt's brain was always thinking, always planning ahead. Although often remembered as shy and quiet to most people, inside his head, it was anything but quiet. Kurt was always planning for his music, his art, his entire expression, to be appreciated and accepted by people. But now he was becoming more famous than even his heroes. Instead of a few hundred people in a music bar, seen as the pinnacle of success to the band, it was now thousands of faces staring up at him on a colossal stage. In other words, it was fame and success that came at a much higher price than Kurt had imagined. Although more confident as a musician, he was still generally an introverted person, who now had to deal with less privacy and less time to adjust. The cold reality is, they were a band now in high demand, which meant constantly touring, constantly appearing on TV and everything in between, with no time to process it all or even have time to rest. Kurt had gotten the fame and success he wanted, but wanting fame is one thing, what kind of fame you get is another, and quite simply, it was more than he bargained for, and there was nothing he could do about it. To simply quit music and be a nobody again, a scenario that Kurt often thought about, would also not be a realistic option, given how instantly recognisable he was now becoming. Perhaps this is why the majority of Kurt's creative outputs, aside from his music of course, generally begins to wane at this point in his life. Not so much because he didn't want to paint or sculpture anymore, but simply because he had no time to do it. Not to mention that in the following year, Kurt would soon become a father to a baby girl named Frances, with his new partner and wife, as well as a fellow singer-songwriter, Courtney Love. In Kurt's eyes, apart from creative expression, giving in to his now increasing addiction to heroin, and Courtney and his new daughter, for a short time at least, these would be the only things that would now motivate him. Though having said this, the world would still be introduced to Kurt's creative side even when he was beginning to deflate with motivation. Following the success of Nevermind, an unexpected call would reach DCG Records from the familiar voice of Jonathan Poman from Sub Pop Records. He would advise that Sub Pop still had possession of many unreleased music from Nirvana that either didn't make it onto the Bleach album or were scrapped entirely. Although amongst the most hardcore Nirvana fans, most of his songs were still circulating around in low quality formats, the band wanted to release their B-sides, demos and unreleased songs with high quality to their audience, and would eventually use this compilation album to release their 1990 non-album single, Sliver. Although not an official follow-up album to Nevermind, it still offered fans another glimpse into the feelings and thoughts of their new grunge hero. The album art itself is completely Kurt Cobain, based off of his own paintings and collected models and dolls. I remember finding this album in HMV way back in the day, just being like, what the heck am I looking at? But I actually adore Kurt's style of uncanny, almost crooked surrealism. Like a stop motion version of a nightmare or a fever dream, there's something so mysterious about it. As for the music itself, it feels almost as if you're on a Nirvana time travelling tour. It's fascinating to hear the different recording qualities and recording techniques from different studios play back to back, hearing how other producers interpret their music. Some of it has amazing clean cut production like on Sliver, Dive and Been a Sun, whilst others like Hairspray Queen, Big Long Now and Aero Zeppelin have that minimal, rough recording quality, as if you're literally listening to a band live on stage, recorded through one microphone. It almost provides an audible catalogue of how Nirvana's sound and songwriting styles change so dramatically and spontaneously, rarely caring for playing one type of rock music, but constantly cherry-picking from different influences. 
Hence probably the reason why most of the songs on Incesticide never made it onto their official album releases. And also why, from a certain point of view, Incesticide is actually one of the most honest representations of their music, or at least how they saw their music. Don't forget, a lot of these songs were dropped originally because either the band or the label felt that they wouldn't appeal to certain music scenes. But this is Nirvana without those kind of constraints on this album. They're warts and all if you like. Which is why it comes to no surprise that this is normally the album that slips under people's radar, but certainly one I'd recommend to any Nirvana fan who's curious to listen to just what the foundation of a band sounds like. With a double-edged success Kurt had acquired, and with the pressures of fame from the release of Nevermind swiftly on the rise, it's little surprise that Kurt wanted to express himself from fresh ideas again, to at least in some way move on from the shadow of their last hit album, which had now pushed a practically unbeatable Michael Jackson out of a number one spot on the Billboard charts. Even though Nevermind originally began as a quest to improve from Bleach, the band still were not satisfied with the end results, now that the dust was beginning to settle. Even though fans adored it, Nirvana felt that the sound was far too polished. Perhaps the band felt this way due to the unforeseen impact in mainstream culture, but either way, they wanted to move on to new horizons. The ambition was there, but the willpower wasn't. Understandably, each member of the band was exhausted and stressed. Although each coping in their own way, the fame and constant spotlight attention would have been overstimulating and draining. But none would be affected as deeply as Kurt. Now with his drug addiction spiralling out of control, with a newborn daughter to raise alongside Courtney, he was undoubtedly the most famous member of the band, and the most sought after by not just fans, but paparazzis, journalists and everyone in between. The last thing that Kurt would possibly want to do at this point is step further into the spotlight and encourage the beast that he thought he wanted to rage further out of control. But conflicted and longing to soothe his lifelong urge to create, he would eventually through the help of bandmates, friends and loved ones, would be able to fight off his grown demons just long enough to head into the studio once again, to produce the third and final studio album that Nirvana ever produced called In Utero. From just a quick glance of the album cover, we can see the world within Kurt's complicated head once again brought to life. The main focus of the artwork is of the transparent anatomical mannequin with angel wings, which as we've already seen and discussed, shows an example of Kurt's fascination in human anatomy as part of a form of expression. Kurt, in fact, created the bizarrely beautiful 3D collage that can be seen on the album's back cover. It consists of model fetuses, a tortoise shell, and what I guess is a real tiny tortoise or turtle in one of the corners of the photo. I mean, Kurt did used to keep little pet turtles at one point, so I can only assume. On top of that, there are many body parts, bones and organs lying in a bed of orchids and lilies, all of which were apparently laid out on Kurt's living room floor. And so the name and concept of the album was finally released, after failing to amuse people with the ironic and sarcastic album name that was originally suggested, I Hate Myself and I Want to Die. Although Nirvana was finally back together after a period of nearly splitting up, the recording experience of a neutro for both the band and their new producer would be looked back upon fondly. Nirvana would elect for former punk frontman and renowned underground producer Steve Albini to take the reins on a neutro, believing him to be a perfect fit due to his cynical outlook on mainstream music and the respect he received from independent artists. In a lot of ways, the whole process of a neutro was rebellious to even their own label, as they would pay for the sessions with their own money, refuse to update DGC on their progress, and refuse any kind of intrusion whatsoever. Albini himself would ignore anyone from the label apart from the band during the whole process and denied accepting any form of royalties, accepting the flat fee of £100,000 from the band only. Although the recording experience for the band was a positive one, and same for Albini to a certain extent, the pressures and pestering of DGC Records would be a separate experience altogether that Albini especially would look back on with bitter disdain. There's a fascinating interview with him on YouTube conducted by Daniel Sarkissian, which details from Albini's perspective just how pushy and disrespectful the label were towards him and the band, 
how the label even wanted them to record the album from scratch when it was finished, even detailing how he went into debt and lost business for a while following the release of In Utero. It is certainly worth a watch, and if you're a big fan of DIY documentaries and interviews, I highly recommend you check out more of Daniel's channel. Although forcibly trying to isolate themselves from micromanagement of DGC records would lead to complications, this was still absolutely vital to achieve the sound that was conceived from this last album of In Utero. It was essentially produced exactly in the way that the band had intended and expected since before Bleach was released. Albini himself considered himself more of an engineer than a producer, allowing the band members to have a final say on what takes would be used. Perhaps it was this full control and a rough and ready style of recording over just a few days that made Nirvana produce such intimate sounding tunes on this album. And by intimate, I mean the band's sound isn't too clean or typically radio friendly quality like on Nevermind, but more like the band is playing live, with Kurt's vocal sounding less dominant over the rest of the music. This makes sense given a large majority of their songs were recorded with the band performing together, as they would on stage, with vocals re-recorded later. In Utero has been described by many fans as a mutant offspring of Bleach and Nevermind, and when you listen to the album in full, you can certainly see why. Nirvana still have some melodic, catchy and even soft songs like Dumb, Penny Royal Tea and All Apologies, yet at the same time, the listener is still greeted with the unmistakable guttural vocals of Kurt with screeching guitars in songs such as Scentless Apprentice, Milk It and Tourette's that echo the same demented energy as Bleach. When I first heard In Utero, I actually bought the album when I was at the airport, and it was back in the day when you had CD Walkmans. Yeah, do you remember how cool we all looked carrying those things around? I must have been like 14 at the time, waiting with my family for our flight, when Scentless Apprentice started playing after their opening song, Serve the Servants, and I was instantly enchanted. Kurt's vocals sound so powerful in that song, you can practically hear the pain in his voice as he screams out the words in the chorus. The song also offers us a glimpse of Kurt's love and appreciation for literature, as the intense lyrics of this song are directly inspired from the novel Perfume by the German writer Patrick Susskind. What's the book about? It's about this um, perfume apprentice in, in um, France at the turn of the century, and he, um, he uh, is just disgusted basically with all humans, and he just can't get away from humans, so he goes on this trek, this uh, walk of death where he just he goes into the rural areas where there's, you know, woods all over the place and the small villages, and, and he only travels by night. And um, he, he just, every time he smells human, like a fire from a far off way, you know, he'll, um, he'll just get really disgusted and hide, and he just tries to stay away from people. I can relate to that. <laughs> Do you ever use what you read in any of your songs? As a matter of fact, I use that very story in Scentless Apprentice. Yeah. It really is an album with the floodgates open for Kurt's creativity and what he wanted to express at the time, from the artwork of the album to the songs themselves. And it makes you wonder how Bleach and Nevermind might have turned out should the process of recording those albums had been in the exact same manner. The song that would truly beckon fans to their new album, however, would be the third dark and ominous song on the album that they would release as a single called Heart Shaped Box which would later be accompanied with the music video, again displaying a lot of imagery from Kurt's paraphernalia and paintings. The release of this single and the album had an interesting scheme devised by the band and the label. They decided to release a neutro at first on vinyl only to alternate markets, and would first air Heart Shaped Box on independent underground radio stations. A curious but admirable act of the band wanting to return to their roots, arguably too where they felt more at home following the intensity of Nevermind. In September 1993, In Utero was released worldwide and debuted number one on the US Billboard charts. The following month, Nirvana would return to the stage to embark on a US tour to promote their new album. Due to the more dynamic guitar sounds on In Utero, usually consisting of more than one guitar riff, another guitarist would be required to play alongside Kurt. They would elect Pat Smear from the punk band Germs, who would play with Dave Grohl again in the band Foo Fighters sometime later. F*** you all, this is the last song of the evening. 
Following the tour, the band's next television concert in October that year could easily be regarded as Kurt's most intimate performance for the TV program MTV Unplugged, in which the band would play their songs acoustically to an audience sitting closely and around them in a circle. The stage is set with black candles, lilies and a crystal chandelier, and Kurt sat in the centre, appearing to be incredibly relaxed and comfortable compared to what close friends had seen recently. Most of the songs they played were either covers or songs lesser known to mainstream audiences, which again, much like the Incesticide album, provides a view into the evolution of Kurt's songwriting, from some of his earlier songs to his most recent. It's fascinating to hear these songs from different stages of Kurt's life played side by side in this stripped down way with Kurt completely in his element, as if listening to him playing songs in his bedroom in Aberdeen, with his vocals going from nearly a whisper, to the powerful scream that he's renowned for, to nothing but acoustic guitars, is truly outstanding to watch and listen to. However, unbeknownst to Nirvana fans, friends and even family, this historic performance would sadly be one of their last. Barely a few months later at the beginning of the following year of 1994, Kurt's depression, anxiety and drug use would again spiral out of control, following an emergency trip to the hospital during a European tour. The headlines would confirm to fans that Kurt had been found unconscious in his hotel room by his wife Courtney Love, due to the dangerous combination of prescribed depressants and alcohol. The rest of the tour would have to be cancelled, and through the help of close friends and family, interventions for Kurt's mental health and drug use would be called to action and he would eventually be encouraged to seek rehabilitation. But even then, it would tragically not be enough. He would flee rehab barely a week later and return to his home in Seattle, possessing a 20-gauge shotgun. And sure enough, an electrician would arrive at the Rockstar's home to discover him lying dead in the greenhouse, with a gun lying on his chest and a pool of blood around his head that had a visible gunshot wound. The singer had seemingly shot himself two days before, leaving a suicide note in a flower pot that would later be read out loud by his wife Courtney at Kurt's memorial in Seattle. The legacy of Nirvana from where they came from, how quickly they became superstars, and how tragically Kurt died, has been stone carved into rock music history ever since, with new generations emerging time and again who can't help but be fascinated and under the spell of Kurt's story and personality. And for me personally, the reason I wanted to choose Kurt Cobain as my first kind of dip into music on this channel is not just because Nirvana are one of my favourite bands, but because Kurt intrigues me as one of the rare individuals in music who happens to not just be a singer, guitarist and songwriter, but he was an artist as a whole. You can tell in many interviews with Chris Novoselic that he was genuinely inspired by Kurt's constant need to make something creative with his hands. And he could have done anything he wanted to do. He could have been a painter, a sculptor. He could have lived in a, uh, he could have done anything he wanted to do. He was just, com so he was compelled. There was that drive that he had that gift as an artist, as expressive. And it was, it was compelling. He was compelled to do it. It really comes to little surprise to me that Kurt was often remembered as quiet for the majority of his life. Often creative people prefer to just live life in their own heads, not just because they feel socially unconfident, but because they're constantly thinking, analysing and learning. Which I think is why Kurt was frequently fond of writing in his journal, just to unload in some way all the noise inside his head. And like I often mention on this channel, when it comes to creative people, sometimes words are completely useless. Sometimes it's impossible to describe a complex emotion or feeling by simply talking to someone. Sometimes it is perfectly summed up in over a thousand words via a painting or a song. And I think that's why so many Nirvana fans feel like they personally knew Kurt in some way, yet at the same time, they feel a sense of mystery around him. 
because although his interviews were hit or miss when explaining himself, sometimes even saying to the interviewer just to listen to the music, the music in a lot of ways sums him up absolutely perfectly, but in a way that still leaves it unconfirmed and up to interpretation. There's nothing to be said, it's all in the music, man. It's all in the music, it's all in the meat. You don't, you don't think that people that are fans of you would like to hear what, what you had in mind, maybe, or what I you were... I hear what they have, have in mind, mind, you know, yeah. or like how they interpret said. it. This, in my opinion, is a definition of the mind of an artist, wanting to communicate with the world only through his craft, and eagerly waiting to discover the world's own reaction and interpretation. In short, that was the entire goal from the moment he formed Nirvana. Although sadly in Kurt's mind, it came at too high a price. I feel his goal was nevertheless achieved, with not only his music, but his entire visions and creations that resonate Kurt's darkest and saddest challenges, to Kurt just having fun and joking around. Which is another thing I wanted to emphasise before wrapping us up is that Kurt wasn't a full-on emo boy like most think he was. He genuinely had a great sense of humour when he was in his comfort zone, and left such a valuable and loving impact on most people he met during his music career. As someone who was incredibly sensitive, and soaked up people's thoughts and feelings like a sponge, the fact that Kurt was celebrated by the grunge scene and demonised by the media as a broken, drug-addicted school dropout who is expected to be the hero of a misled youth and villain to conservatism can't be taken lightly. It was never something that Kurt asked for, but as is the way of sensationalism, it has no gears or tuning pegs, and often can take on a life of its own, to the point where even Kurt could not erase the image and the preconception that the world had of him. If there's one thing that we can learn from Kurt's story, is that regardless of how much we may love someone's art, or how much we may look up to them, and how much we expect from them, celebrities are not public property, even though it's very easy sometimes to think that they are. Like all people, celebrities grow, change, and have certain needs in order to live happily. But when their entire image, persona, and temperament is often represented entirely by the media, and usually done so out of context, it could be something absolutely devastating for sensitive creatives out there who may struggle with mental health or drug addiction, or who simply just want their attention to be aimed at their work instead of directly on themselves. Which is why I wanted to title this video, The Creations of Kurt Cobain, because the amount of skill, insight, and imagination that could be found in all types of Kurt's art is nearly endless to explore. Thank you so much for watching everyone, I hope you enjoyed this slightly different topic today. I'm always open to feedback and suggestions on who you might want me to cover in future, so please let me know in the comments. Before I go, it's that time again for Artist Corner, where I get to share some interesting art sent in by one of my viewers. And today, we will be looking at the hauntingly beautiful works of Victoria Zukova. Victoria is a painter from Bulgaria who works primarily with oil paints, producing some truly dreamlike visions that she releases on her website. Amazingly, although Victoria is currently a computer animation student, she was not formally trained in art, teaching herself how to use oil mediums during COVID-19 and quarantine in 2020, with most of the art you see here now being produced in that year. I think it's simply stunning to see such a difficult medium to master, from my experience anyway, be executed so expertly from someone with no previous training, but just the talent and willpower to achieve such paintings. I love her style of incorporating musical instruments into her concepts as well. Victoria tells me she's very fond of music, and considers it to be a huge source of inspiration. She aims to express strong feelings such as longing and nostalgia through the metaphor of a musical instrument. She says it's fun to take everyday objects and imagine them in absurd situations, then they start to have a whole new meaning. Thanks to her strong memory, she's able to associate melodies and songs with certain places and times of her life, hence why she likes to depict memories as musical instruments. My favourite of hers is the one called Mantis. I used to suffer from sleep paralysis quite often, especially when I was young, and for some reason the imagery in this piece brings me back to those sensations I felt whenever it would creep up on me. The idea of someone living in my head and looming over me, not letting me escape. 
though Victoria tells me it has no specific premise. She says it's named Mantis after the praying mantis, aka one of my favourite animals, as the imagery reminded her of someone in prayer. Her style is just so alluring and mysterious, I couldn't help but share her art with you today. So I want to personally thank Victoria for getting in touch and invite you guys to have a look at her website via the link that you see here and in the description below. If you too are an artist and potentially want your work to feature in a future video, please send me examples of your art and a bit about yourself to blinddweller at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter should you want to get in touch with me on there. As always, a huge thank you to my top tier channel members for this month. Port Perea, Classy Chassis, Wendy Go, Ken B, Carol Hartung, and Garrett Greathouse. Thank you to each of you for your continued support, it really does mean a lot. And if you too would like a shout out in a future video, or want to see my videos early, please consider becoming a channel member today, for as little as $2.99 a month. That's all for me today, see you in the next video soon, and bye for now.